Thank, thanks, Ben. Um, this is my first time at Tapestry, um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I tend to go to cartography conferences that are purely just about map geeks talking about maps. Um, so, you know, be nice to me. Um, so the cartography of elections, you, you'll gather now that I'm one of uh, a number of Brits here, and uh, I'm fascinated by elections because uh, the maps come around every so often, and recently the maps have been coming around with even more frequency. Um, so even though elections are like fascinating events, I, I like the sideshow of the cartography of an election, seeing what's going on, seeing how people are making maps and what, what they're doing. Um, the title, This Is My Truth, Tell Me Yours, I'll... Um, I'll elaborate on that in the very last slide, but it's a famous quote by a um, British politician, a Welsh politician from the uh, 1940s, um, who is really just trying to think of maps and politics and the way in which we express information um, and how we avoid telling the truth half the time. And that kind of resonates now, I think, in some respects. Uh, it's also the title of a great 1998 album by Manic Street Preachers, if you want to go and get some, uh, some good music. So, um, we've had some uh, fascinating things over the last few years, agreed. Uh, we've had some really interesting characters. Um, <laughs> sort of, have I got a smile for you, Robert, or just sort of look really thoughtful? I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, <laughs> That's really off-putting, you know. Um, we've had a fascinating time, and, 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 and being a Brit who's been here now seven years, I, I've, I've looked at election mapping as a way to try and understand American politics and failed miserably in understanding American politics. But um, as you can see there, we've been having our own problems back in the UK as, as well. So we're going to take a look at a few examples of recent elections, plus some efforts that I've gone to. Uh, oh, this guy loves maps. We all love maps, right? Um, and politicians, and I use that term lightly, are very fond of maps in order to try to um, talk to their base and to feed them certain information. Um, and, of course, we can use maps in very, very persuasive ways. Some might even call them propagandist ways. They become part of the narrative, they become part of the story. Um, but they're supposed to be a trusted mechanism, right? And the general population um, looks at a map and sees what they see and their perceptual and cognitive processes will uh, mean that they understand certain things in certain ways. So when we see this kind of map going up in the White House, um, you know, many of us uh, might look at that and go, well, that's a disgrace. It's an awful map. It's a terrible way of displaying the results of the election um, because it, it, it's perhaps not objective. Um, I would contend that it, it, it's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that map. It's technically perfectly acceptable. And if I was President Trump, that's the map I would put up on my wall because it's got a lot of red on it. Fortunately, I'm not President Trump. Um, Let's go back in time a little bit, though, because there are obviously a lot of different ways of uh, representing maps. These are some great maps from the uh, late 1800s in the, the UK newspaper, The Times, cartograms. These are not new things. They've been a long, around for an awful long time um, to show the way in which we might represent results uh, based on population distribution as opposed to just purely geography. Uh, Professor Danny Dawling in the 1980s did the same. But here, I don't know, he, he's a good friend of mine, so he won't mind me saying that he went over the top here. You know, this is a, a multivariate, uh, crazy kind of set of maps that try to look at mapping political outcome against socioeconomic circumstance. And the map tries to convey that message. And then even recently, this is the 2015 election uh, in the UK, um, a range of different approaches. But I sense that... Um, in a lot of media, uh, we're converging on the cartogram as a way to represent um, the information. People are becoming a lot more familiar with the idea of a cartogram as opposed to the geographical representation, uh, to the extent that the BBC made a giant floor cartogram that they could walk across and fill in the hexagons. And, of course, hexagons, who doesn't love a hexagon? And, you know, this has become a very standard approach. And familiarity helps the reader actually understand what's going on a little bit more. Um, so here we've got some examples from The Independent. Um, the bottom three are from The Guardian. Um, actually, I thought that was, that was one of the best um, uh, sets of maps of the 2015 election. 
Let's flip to the US, um, perhaps the first example of a US selection map appearing um, in a US Census Bureau atlas from uh, 1883. Uh, again, it's a choropleth, but look at the detail. It's got context. There's summary maps, there's insets, there's graphs. Um, color is being used systematically, um, and there's a lot of information going on in there. Step forward to um, the 2016 presidential election. These are the kind of maps that we're seeing from the New York Times, Daily Kos, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Washington Post. Um, and again, a lot of cartograms, but certainly also you know, the, the geographical map as well making an appearance. People have a very strong affinity with the geography because they recognize it, they can understand it. They can point to a map and say, this is where I am and I understand what's around me. You give them something like that map in the top right and it's harder. The process of actually retrieving information from a, a cartogram or a, a graphic of the map, if you like, um, becomes um, difficult, potentially. There were some really good examples, I thought, uh, from the 2016 <coughs> election. Uh, this by the Washington Post. Lots of different things going on here, but actually a very simple representation. And the beauty of this is that it scrolled up and down, and west was at the bottom of a, a browser, and, and east was at the top. So it flipped the map and used this mountainscape in a really inventive way. And um, ah, I'm going to stick up for 538, just, just because I thought they did a, a, a great example in 2016 of the cartogram, but also proving that the map isn't always the message. You know, using this little sort of river graphic uh, was a great way of showing um, how many votes um, each candidate needed and where the line uh, was drawn um, along that sort of river. And I actually thought that was probably better than any map I'd seen of the, the 2016 election. The uh, Wall Street Journal published a daisymetric dot density map. Um, again, a lot going on here. Um, and I'll come back to daisymetric dot density uh, in a moment. Another that I thought was extremely good was the Financial Times, who did a, a lovely um, map that they referred to as the compromise. And I like that in cartography and in mapping in general, because you always have to compromise on something. Um, actually, what the Financial Times did here was, was not compromise. They put the geography on the map, and they put a kind of a cartogram on the map on top of it. So we get the familiarity of the true shapes of geography sitting underneath, and we get the abstract nature of the symbols with the colors and the numbers that equate to electoral college votes sitting across the top. Um, it's like they took the best of a lot of different components for their, their solution. And of course, we can have some artistic effects. You'll have seen, uh, this is Tim Wallace's uh, fantastically imagined, very artistic approach to look at the topography, I guess, of, of the election, Trump's America and Clinton's America. And then the New York Times also came up with a, a, a sort of a double gatefold um, approach, but reverted, interestingly, in the print media back to a choropleth map, this very traditional, very old, very familiar way of looking at elections. Um, and I, I, I thought they perhaps didn't do as good a job as maybe some of Tim's maps in this, in this case. Um, but don't take my word for it, because what's the best mechanism of judging any quality these days? That's right, Twitter. So in my, in my timeline, and I haven't photoshopped this, uh, these are two people that I follow. Um, and uh, at, the top, um, at the top, we've got Brian. Um, cartographic damage assessment, a shame that an impressive print product is so visually misleading, followed closely by another good friend of mine. That's really cool. So the point here is you, you can't make your reader understand the map, if that makes sense, because the same map is going to be seen in many, many different ways, even by experts, even by people who know about cartography. So if your readership is generally people who don't know about cartography and don't know how to make the map or read the map or deconstruct the map or look at the meaning behind the map, um, then we have to be very mindful of those facts. And there's perhaps no more uh, shining example of that than this, this map, um, which, yeah, in this audience we might find amusing because we can see what's wrong with it already. But, you know, this map was retweeted um, several hundreds of thousands of times, and this is what propagates across social media these days. Um, so I deliberately tried to do exactly the same. I didn't, actually. Um, 
I was trying to get our software to create a decent map, and it came up with um, this daisymetric dot density map over on the left. Um, and I was really excited because I'd finally got our software to churn out several hundred thousands of dots fairly quickly. And being really excited at the end of the day, I took a quick screen grab and I shoved it on the internet uh, and then went home and thought nothing of it. And then the next morning I wake up and of course all hell's broken loose and it was my one viral hit. Um, and I love the, what this, this, this guy over the right did with it. They took that very famous picture of uh, Trump's map and just photoshopped mine on top of it as if it was a, a, better, a better map. Um, better is a, a strange word as well um, because it's just a different version of the truth, right? Um, technically, it's no more or less accurate than uh, Trump's map, but it tells a different story. It paints a different picture. And, of course, you know, you get picked up by various uh, media channels who want to s sort of think and talk about these things. So I've been fascinated by election maps, and I just want to show you um, a few of them um, as a way to try to encourage all of us to think a little bit about cartography and think a little bit about the map that you're making. Um, because, as I said previously, your audience won't be thinking about how you made it. So if I can just sort of um, very nervously uh, tab out to um, a browser. Can we duplicate? Yeah, I've got a browser on my screen. Can we? All right. OK, let's do that. Uh, OK. Cool, thank you. Um, so if you go to that URL, carto.maps.arcgis.com, that's just where I dump all my stuff. Some of it's interesting, some of it's absolute rubbish. Um, but it's, it's a, a sandbox, a playground. Um, and within here are a load of election maps. Uh, the first one um, is what I call election pollocks. Um, and I, 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 actually put, I liked using the word pollocks because it allowed me to use the word pollocks on an Esri website and my American colleagues didn't really understand what I was getting at. Um, but it, it was a way for me to try and characterize the mess of the British election in 2016 with all these beautiful rich colors of various parties and, and uh, the fact that the Scottish National Party took most of uh, Scotland, if not all. Um, and also, somebody pointed out, this creates the nice shape of the Loch Ness Monster um, going across Scotland. Um, so. As Mona said, you know, perhaps sometimes you shouldn't let these maps out in the public, but I kind of like to, just because, you know, who would ever make a map like that? Well, you might. You might also spend absolutely months breaking your software to try to build something that is absolutely appalling uh, at communicating. And, you know, I can, I can make you dizzy. I can make you dizzy and dizzier and dizzier. Um, so, you know, just because the technology allows you to do it, I would... Uh, and this is the worst. I would strongly, <laughs> strongly encourage you not to. So this is a, this is a, oh, it should be like a, an AA meeting. I should be apologising to you. <laughs> anyway, the real, the real point about this is to, um, that I've made a gallery. I've created, there are about 30, 30 maps in this gallery. And if you go to each one, and I'm not going to go through each one, you'll be delighted to know, um, there's a little information panel that talks to you a little bit about the, uh, the map technique, the type, the data requirements, um, the pros, the cons, and so on and so forth. Um, so here we've got a, a daisymetric dot density. Um, this, is the, this is one dot for one vote. Um, and hopefully you're sitting there and saying, well, that's impossible to map. And you're right, because it's from aggregate data. So the point here is you don't zoom in too much, otherwise you infer too much in the, in the data. Um, this is one where I actually looked at the differences between counties, and I put up a little rope like you get at the cinema, you know, do not, do not cross. Um, what are your neighbours like? Well, coropleths give us some sense of similarity, but you put a little rope between and you say, well, you know, what are my neighbours like? What are they really like? Um, you know, blue rope for Democrat, Democratic neighbours, red rope for um, Republican neighbours, and the thickness of the rope for how different their vote was. Different way of looking at it. Uh, why not just put the data on the map? You know, that's an option. Um, instead of um, actually symbolising it, just put the data on the map itself and use colour 
and size to emphasize things. And then finally, again, a map that you perhaps shouldn't do, but um, uh, this is based on uh, Escher's tessellating shapes. So I thought, well, why, why wouldn't you, and why wouldn't you, tessellate Trump, Trump and Clinton? <laughs> and what I particularly like is, is Hillary's fist um, and how it tessellates. Um, it was a metaphor at the time. Um, maybe one that doesn't work. But I, again, as an example of, of what you maybe should or shouldn't do, um, one of the directors at my company actually emailed me after I put this out on the interwebs and said, um, you do realise that um, if you look hard enough, there's swastikas in this map. And I hadn't thought about it. And um, I apologised most profusely and uh, said, well, you know, you can pretty much find anything in any map if you look hard enough. So that's a little... Um, a little run through, um, just to finish up uh, from the current slide. Um, that's where all those maps sit, if you wish to go and have a, a little play. I also find the idea of sketching very informative. Um, so I did get my pencils and colours out um, a couple of years ago as a cathartic exercise, um, just to try and make a, a different kind of map altogether. Uh, I can't show that because that's not nice to anybody. So, the point is, with an awful lot of design choices, we might call them fake maps or alternate realities, um, you know, different maps are abound, and you can make the map say anything you want, and people are making them say anything they want. Cartograms still polarise opinion, but um, they're becoming much more common, and so you can use them a lot more um, readily, and, uh, and hopefully that your audience will understand them a little bit more clearly. Um, experimentation exists, innovation is rife, which is great for a, a subject like cartography that's been around for, you know, millennia. Um, and my last sort of parting words are none of these maps are right and none of them are wrong, but they all tell different versions of the truth. So, where do you go for, you know, finding more out about this? Well, I've written a book. Um, I'm actually going to give one copy away. Uh, in a moment. I'm going to hide one of my business cards out in the lounge out there and if you want to get a free copy of a book then go and find it. Um, but the reason I wanted to mention this actually was because um, Alberto Cairo asked me after I finished this, I, I showed him a preview of this in January and he said, um, what are you going to write for your second book? And I said, never again. That was way too much way too much effort. So what I'd like to do is announce the second book that uh, <laughs> he said I'd never write, or I said I'd never write, which is going to be basically this talk magnified. Um, so it's going to be a book with 100 maps using one data set, um, that Trump-Clinton data set, to explore different cartographies and how you can go from a very blue-looking map to a very red-looking map along this whole uh, continuum. So the website will get you 30 or 40 of those maps uh, to this point, um, but this next sort of uh, opus is kind of on its way. So with that, thank you very much for your attention.